get a show of hands. Uh, how many people here have experience in computer vision or machine learning or artificial intelligence? So maybe, yeah, a few. What I wanted to do is start with a little bit of an experiment. Can I have anyone tell me what this is a photograph of? No. You know? Yell it out. The Singapore Gosen Museum. The Singapore Art Museum. And that's absolutely right. And if I ask the computer what this is, it says it's a close-up of a stove with very low confidence. Now, for those who have been to Singapore, you might recognize it a bit clearer in this image here, with um, a little less blur and a little more detail. Again, if I ask the computer what this is a photograph of, it says it's an airplane that is lit up at night and it has a very low confidence. It thinks it sees the underside of an airplane. Now, the reason for this is that when we're working with computer vision and we're working with these, these type of computer models, they only really know uh, the context of what they've been trained to understand. And it's really hard to get a model that understands kind of everything that we can see and we know. We build up our context over time from the places we've been and the things that we see. And when we're training a computer, it's harder to get that degree of granularity. And if we think about computer vision, um, I studied computer vision at university more than 20 years ago, and the problems were the same. So the things that we're doing now in relation to computer vision and AI are the same problems we were solving back then. The first one is really image classification. This is kind of a binary. It could be, is there a deer in this image? Is there not a deer in this image? Um, the example around skin cancer, you might have a photograph of a mole and you might want to know, is this potentially malign mal malignant and that I need to get it looked at or is it harmless? Um, these kind of questions, you know, what is that? Is there a building in this image? Um, object detection. So it's not just, does this image contain a certain thing? It's whereabouts is this thing in the image? Um, so you could use this in a scenario when you're in a manufacturing organization and you might say, is everybody wearing a safety helmet? Because part of the requirements of being on that building site could be that you need a safety helmet. Um, so you may want to use object detection to see if that's actually true. And if it is true, if the person's not wearing one, you might want to trigger some other kind of operation. Uh, image segmentation. This is where exactly is the, is the deer. This is really cutting out the pixels and finding it within the, the context of the object. And this is pretty important when we think about autonomous vehicles and we think about scenarios where we have to identify lots of different objects in a moving scene and we need to know exactly where the thing is that we're navigating around or trying to avoid or trying to identify. And then the last one, um, you're probably familiar with this if you've done reverse image search or looking up something based on an image. You might see a photo um, of a particular item and then be shown other things that look like that, that uh, using that kind of image search approach. So those are kind of four concepts. Also, it's probably worth mentioning the difference between machine learning um, and the context of deep learning. So with machine learning, there tends to be a domain expert. There tends to be somebody who really understands the area that you're building the model for. And that person can identify the features of what's really important, and then they can put those together in some form of model or classification that can lead to the answer to the question that you're trying to solve. Uh, with deep learning, and specifically with computer vision, if we talk about the concept of uh, deep convolutional neural nets, you might have heard the term CNN or DCNN. That stands for a deep convolutional neural network. In that um, area, the feature extraction and the classification actually happens by the algorithm itself. So there isn't a person involved in the process. Uh, the algorithm is determining the outcome uh, using many layers or many hidden layers of calculation. And then it's not until the end where you get to these connected layers that it's actually putting all those pieces together uh, to solve the original problem that you wanted to solve. So if you look at a deep neural network for computer vision, 
has got an input here, which is a photo of my dog, and an output, which is... Oh, sorry, I haven't changed that. I'm still saying it's a cat. <laughs> Should be saying it's a dog. And then uh, these convolutional layers where the first layers, like the um, outside layers, are doing things like looking for low-level features in the image. So this is things like lines, edges, colors, uh, those type of things. Uh, next layer is looking for high-level features. So this is things like corners, contours, and simple shapes, faces and circles. And then over here, it's more complicated um, uh, objects as we get further into the network. So this is things like wheels and faces and windows. And this is really modeled to work the same way that the human brain works. So when you think about inside your brain, you've got all of these neurons and they're all firing uh, at different, uh, sorry, at solving different parts of the problem. So you might have a neuron that's identifying aspects of what you're looking at. And this is the same kind of approach. We'll identify all these different aspects or features inside of the image. And then it's at the end that we'll bring all of those back together to identify the scene or the thing that we're looking at. And that's where we'll find a complex scene of a, a dog or people or a beach or the type of um, things that you'll find inside the object. So in um, computer vision, and some of the advancements that we've made in the last four or five years have really come about a couple of things. One is access to a huge amount of data. So since we started creating digital um, assets, lots of cell phone cameras, lots of videos, lots of digital data sets, we've got a huge amount of uh, data that we can now train our models on. And a lot of, uh, some people have been through the painstaking job of labeling all this and making it all available so that you can actually start to implement it in your own solutions. Uh, the next thing is, the advancement in cloud computing and GPUs and processing that can do all of the matrix multiplication and the calculus to um, form the outcomes of the algorithms. So this is things like the um, gradient descents and, and, the, and the levels of calculation that are required to actually build up the models in the first place. And then the third part is access to pre-trained models. Um, so having companies like Microsoft, like Google, like Facebook, go out and build these highly trained uh, models from millions and millions of data points, and then make those available to people like yourselves, who can then pick them up and transfer them to have a different outcome or a different purpose. So what we call about, what we talk about there is this concept of transfer learning. So you might have a existing convolutional neural net built from a general task and then you might want to strip the output layer and then retrain that model to identify something different. So you could do that by taking that last layer off that says is it a cat, a dog or a car and then you could actually achieve the outcome with much less training. So in this case it might take millions of images to create the original model and then you could put instead of that thousands of images uh, in the last layer, so now that this model can do something different. Previously it could detect cats and dogs and cars, now with a little bit of extra work it's able to identify deers uh, from itself. And that requires just training, training one or more layers in the new network. And we talk about having these models, there's a, a website, ImageNet, Any, who's familiar with ImageNet? So, no, a couple of hands. So ImageNet is one of these amazing resources of, I think, 14,197,122 images. And all of those images are categorized into all these different areas. And so a lot of the models that we see today have been trained off a data set like ImageNet, where that's where it's getting its base learning from. And then what you're able to do is you can pick that up and then apply this model of transfer learning to have a, a different type of outcome. And the algorithms that are being used, um, so back in 2012, uh, there's a competition called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, or ILSVRC for short, um, that was really around what are the best algorithms out there that can solve this particular kind of computer vision problem. And back in uh, 2012, uh, the winner of the competition was an algorithm called AlexNet, and it was eight layers deep. When we talked about those hidden layers, it had eight layers to it. Now, the guy who invented it happened to be called Alex, and he named it AlexNet. 
you know, circa 2012. Uh, VGG came in 2014, and that was 19 layers deep. And that was the one that won the competition in that year. Uh, in 2014, uh, Google Net came in with this model of um, inception. So it was 22 layers, but it also is a network that looks in onto itself. So as it goes through, it also looks back on itself and it trains at those other um, steps. And they called this um, inception. And then in um, 2015, Microsoft came along with ResNet, uh, which used this context that at the time, the common thinking was that the network couldn't be deeper than, say, 22 layers. And if you went deeper than that, uh, it would use this problem called overfitting, where it would, get, it would actually get to too much of a degree of um, detail, and you wouldn't be able to take it back and put it back together um, as it just solves the common problem. Um, but the team at the, at the time solved this by creating a 152 layer deep a neural net called ResNet that solved that challenge and set a new bar on accuracy um, back in 2015. Um, from there, we've moved on from this idea of image classification, and the new focus area is this area called uh, common objects and context. So this is another data set that uh, Microsoft's been behind, and this is really not just about identifying the objects, but actually identifying them as a segmentation in the image um, in the context that they appear within. And the winner uh, last year in the COCO competition was actually uh, a version of Google's um, Inception, they call Inception V3, that also uses ResNet alongside the original um, Google Inception engine. So they're now using what's called an ensemble of um, neural networks to solve this problem. Uh, I've spent a bit of time talking about deep convolutional neural nets, which is really used mainly in computer vision. There's a bunch of other types of um, deep neural networks as well. So recurrent neural networks are used a lot for natural language processing. Uh, deep belief networks for things like speech and music, uh, live translation, some of those type of approaches. And deep reinforcement learning, you'll see that in gaming or scenarios where you want to identify human behavior. And that's being used quite often to determine, you know, is the person um, uh, when to maximise rewards for things like vouchers and, um, and gaming and, and those type of solutions. Now, the reason I wanted to give you this primer is you're probably familiar with how convolutional neural nets show up um, inside uh, computer software. So this example... Um, you might find when you do a photo search, go photos.google.com and search, um, there might be faces that pop up that are identified across your photographs. Uh, Microsoft's Face API, it's another example of having a convolutional neural net that then gets trained on a new data set. Um, you see this in, in, in many places, and I'll show you an example of this. So there's an application that we've released called the Intelligent Kiosk. And the source code for this is out on GitHub. I'll share the links at the end. There's a version that runs on a Raspberry Pi, and there's also a version that runs on a, on a, on a PC. Um, but what this is really doing is using that idea of a face API. So if you look in here, it sees me in real time. And if you noticed up there, it went from saying male and uh, percentage that it, it's guessing the age and my expression. I'm now happy and a bit older. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is it's got my name up there. So it's not just identifying the person, it's actually identifying me specifically. And if I showed it a photo, I've got a photo here of my grandma and my daughter. Um, you notice it's now identified my grandma, her age, and my daughter, and her age um, in that photograph as well. So the way that it's able to do that is if I come over here into the space setup, um, it's using this concept of transfer learning. So down here, um, there's my examples, and there's actually five photos that I've given it to train on me. Um, if I look at my daughter, um, I've only shown it photos of her when she's a little bit older, but if you notice, it actually 
did a pretty good job of identifying her as a baby. So it was able to look at the, the, the face map and the symmetry and determine that that was probably still her um, at a younger age. And the same with my grandma. I gave it examples of her when she was younger and older, um, and it, it built the recognition and mapping from that. So that there is, you know, a example of, uh, of using that type of concept of transfer learning. Um, we also have a service which is customvision.ai. So anyone familiar with custom vision? It's a couple of hands. So what customvision.ai does is it's really an easy to use tool for prototyping and creating some of these types of, um, of models that you might like to create. And you can create custom image classifiers and then have them um, build the models that you can then download and use inside of your applications. And it uses the same concept of transfer learning um, to recreate and build a new model and then to take the outcome of that model um, and export it uh, for you to use. So if I share an example of customvision.ai, um, uh, custom vision end to end. I've got an app here which um, is written in C-sharp, and I'll again share the link to the GitHub for this at the end. Um, but what this is really doing, this is using Bing Search to go and look for particular images that you define. So over here inside Tags, um, I've done a search here for Sydney Opera House, Singapore Art Science Museum, and Lotus Temple in India. In India. And the reason I've chosen these three buildings is they all look quite similar uh, to the untrained eye. And they are buildings that are shaped, you know, different to other types of buildings. So if I wanted to build a classifier that could identify the Singapore Art Science Museum and then have it identify uh, alongside, say, some of these other types of buildings, I could do a search term with those specific terms. And then what it does is it downloads um, images of those buildings from Bing and it uploads them um, into this custom AI using the API. And what, when I have a look over here, um, inside it's got a bunch of images that it's found um, identifying each of these three different types of buildings. Now what I'm also doing in this code is there's a bit of a trick. If you don't have a lot of examples, so when you're building one of these transfer learning models, if you've only got a small amount of examples, and when I say small, I mean like 100 or 200 images, there's a technique which is called um, image pre-processing, where you'll do things like um, smart cropping the images to being a certain size, normalizing the histogram of the colors that are inside of it, and then you can do things like flipping the image, rotating the image, to provide multiple versions of the same image so that um, when the model is learning, it's not going to get confused by um, specific you know, angles and specific uh, versions of what you're looking at. So what I've done is inside the code, I've just done things like um, normalizing the images, cropping the images, doing some smart rotations, and then uploading that in an image set. So I've got 350 images for the Lotus Temple um, it's actually not that many, it's about 100 images, but it, oh, 80, 80 to 100 images, but it's got that rotation approach um, applied to it. And then I have held images back to test my model. And uh, there's a thing called a confusion matrix, which is essentially, you've got 70% or so um, of what you want to use to train your model, and then you hold back like 30% of your data to test it afterwards. And the reason you hold back the data is so that when you, because you have to work out how good your model is, and if you test your model against the stuff you've used to train it, it's always going to get the right answer. Whereas if you show it stuff it hasn't seen before that you know is um, a certain th outcome, then you can test the effectiveness of the model. Um, so what I'm able to do over in this example, oh, okay, I'll try not to knock it. Um, and then inside of this application, where are we? Uh, custom vision end to end. If I go out, um, <coughs> I 
I've built uh, a couple of uh, I've built a couple of uh, versions of this. So inside my object over here uh, in my debug window. Uh, Yeah, you'll notice I've, I've created a couple of directories here, and uh, one of them is called buildings, one of them is called native birds, and inside this buildings one, uh, there's my data, and there's a test set and a training set. Inside the training set is these three folders, which um, associate to those tags, and then inside there, um, are the image that it's down, are the images it's downloaded from the uh, Bing Search API. Um, if I look at the test set, it's got another set of images it hasn't seen, and then it's written this CSV down here, which is results, and this is the confusion matrix. So when I look inside of this Excel spreadsheet, um, it's scoring the model. So over here, um, it's going to have all the tags that I've created and then the app um, of those particular tags. So if I just zoom back out, um, you notice over here, there's the Lotus Temple and it's basically said in all the images it's tested, it's got that correct. It's, it's correctly identified them, except for once it thought that the um, Singapore Art Science Museum was the Sydney Opera House. So there's kind of one image that it, it tripped up on. So that gives you an idea of how to test the model that you're building um, as well as, as, as running it. And uh, what I've done too is I built another model um, based on native birds in New Zealand um, and Australia because there's a bunch of different birds that, that look similar and I thought I'd go away and build a, um, a trained uh, model for this. So this one over here has cockatoos, fantails, kakas, kakapo, kia. These are all types of birds that um, if you weren't familiar, you wouldn't necessarily identify the difference between. So a kia is a South Island parrot that looks a bit like this. Um, a kaka, in contrast, is a North Island parrot um, in New Zealand, and it looks like this. Um, so to somebody who doesn't really see the, much of the difference, this is actually a really hard um, problem to try and solve because you know, to many people, a, kaka and a, kaka, a kia and a kaka um, look exactly the same. So I was intentionally trying to find something that um, was a little bit more difficult uh, because there's a lot of similarities between the particular types of birds. And then there's a moorpork, which is like an owl, so there's an easier period of identification there. And so I did this and built the, the decision matrix and, and applied it. Um, and then when you look at the performance, you get a little tab over here that shows you the performance and the recall of your model. So here, precision 99.5%, um, recall 93%. So that's actually a lot better than if I hadn't done the image augmentation and the pre-processing. Um, that brought it up from about 82% to about you know, 93% on recall, which, which is quite an improvement. And then what I've done over here is, um, I've actually, you notice there's an, a little tab up here which says export. And that means you can actually now export this model into a Core ML model or an Android TensorFlow. And what this is doing is it's saying, okay, you can operationalize your models and you can have them stored on a cloud service, and then you can call them through a web service endpoint with a test image, and you can get the answer back that way. Uh, but what we're starting to do is move to this, this area of edge uh, where we take the models that we've created and trained and, and, and um, improved, and then we actually export those and start running those disconnected from the internet on lower um, you know, memory devices. There's, there's a um, solution at Microsoft which is called uh, the Embedded Learning Library here. And it's an open source library for embedding AI and machine learning on very small hardware. 
So supported on things like um, Raspberry Pi uh, and you know lower level lower level hardware. So there's a repository for that, and I'll, I'll share some examples for that as well. And this example over here is using um, the uh, iOS and TensorFlow. So in this case, um, I've got another project which is a uh, Xamarin application. And this Xamarin application is a universal app that has a export for Android and a, uh, sorry, a project file for iOS and a project file for Android. On the iOS side, it takes the Core ML model export. On the Android side, it takes the TensorFlow model export. So what's happening is in Apple's, what's Apple's doing is they're putting custom, um, they're, they're supporting these exported uh, machine learning models custom uh, accelerated inside of their phones using this Core ML. Um, Google's doing the same with TensorFlow in the later version of the Android phones. And so what I'm able to do is then I can then deploy this um, out onto my phone. So my phone, if I just connect it here, it's now um, identified, or it should be identified, Plug it in. Yeah, it, it's, it becomes a deploy target here. So there's my um, there's my phone there's my phone there. So that's the one I've currently got plugged in. So now I can actually deploy and um, debug uh, this solution on the phone itself. And if I show you that running, um, this has now got the model that I built um, using the custom vision and it's running on this phone disconnected from the internet. So this phone does not need you know, to connect back to some other kind of service. It's using this opti you know, optimized um, uh, compact model. So then I can say go, and it's gonna show up the camera, and I can take a photo of you. And it's gonna say, I don't, I don't know who that is. Um, and the reason for that is because this is what the model that I've deployed onto this phone is my New Zealand native bird model. So unless there's a New Zealand native bird in the audience, it's not going to identify what the photograph is. But luckily, I've brought my, my daughter's um, soft toys with me. So they've both got soft toys for um, New Zealand native birds. And this one here, they actually make the noise of the toy as well. So, um... <laughs> so that's the actual um, uh, call of the Moorpork. And uh, this is the Kia, not the Kaka. And it's got a, um, I think it's got a call as well somewhere out uh, there. Yeah. So hopefully, I can take a photograph of these, and it will identify them. Bearing in mind that it's been trained off real photos of the real birds, it hasn't been trained off um, the toys. So if the toys are close enough to what the actual birds looks like, um, this will work. If they're not, it won't. So let's see. Hello Kia. So I got that one correct. Let's try this one. Remember those photos I showed you before um, of the owl? That, so that's what it's trained off. I don't know who that is. Oh. <laughs> I into disconnected devices or um, or mobile devices. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that there's not really a consistent um, approach to how the models get um, operationalized and exported. Um, so there's a site here called, uh, there's, a, there's an initiative called the Open, Open Neuro Network Exchange Format, uh, or ONNX.AI for short. Now, this is a bit of a combination between Facebook, Microsoft, and AWS. Um, around creating a standard format uh, for uh, exporting 
these kind of neural network models uh, for use inside of applications. And about 10 days ago, Microsoft announced um, a new uh, initiative, which is Windows ML. So who's heard of Windows ML? Any? Couple of hands. So what Windows ML is, is it's taking these ONNX models and enabling you as application developers um, and engineers to use them um, inside of Windows. And it takes care of all the hardware acceleration, access to the GPU, does it have a GPU, is it a CPU, and can it run efficiently um, disconnected on the machine? And so what you can do at the moment is you could take a core ML model and you could use a couple of lines of Python and export it into an ONNX model and then you could put that ONNX model uh, inside the application on Windows. Um, so to give you a couple... <coughs> and this is coming in the next version of Windows but it's available um, today in the Insider Preview. Um, and so what you'll see here is I've got a couple of the samples that have been running um, from, because I'm running the uh, preview of the fast track. So you can get this if you go onto the Windows Insider Previews fast track. And if I show you this example here, um, this is one of the samples that ships uh, with Windows ML. And this is a UWP application and it's using a standard um, handwritten, uh, I suppose, um, handwritten digit data set that's very common in tutorials uh, for TensorFlow. And I can do things like, you know, write the number six. Oh, clear that. And then this is using that um, Core ML model, um, sorry, not ONNX model, to identify what I'm writing um, on the screen um, using that format. Uh, there's another example over here, which is the squeeze net. Um, this is another uh, here where I've got an ONNX um, model which has been exported. And if I run this one, it's taking a a uh, trained model that identifies a lot of um, images, a, a lot of different labeled data sets for images, and I can show it a particular image. So it's loading that um, in, inside of my GPU, and I can choose a, t a particular dog photo, and it's going to go away and say, actually, I think I'm seeing a beagle with 52% confidence there. Um, if I show it a photo from my, my desktop, show my dog, it's seeing a standard schnauzer with 59% confidence. Um, if I show it a bird photo, it's seeing a, uh, a little blue heron uh, with about 34% confidence. And so it's, it's been trained on a lot of things, this particular example. And this is essentially disconnected, um, again, running as a model. And that's about five megabyte in size, that, that model that's, that's down here on the client. Um, you'll also see examples where this is running live. Um, so here's another little sample app uh, that will take an uh, array of um, different Windows machine learning ONX models. And for this one, um, you can show it photos, it's been trained to recognize defective um, circuit boards. Um, so you can identify different circuit boards and it will tell you if it's defective or not based on those broken lines. Um, with this one, you can also do a live um, version of it, but it's, not, it's running in real time, but it's not finding anything. But what's kind of interesting is you look at the frames per second, sort of five frames a second. If I switch that over to GPU, um, it should kick up a little bit and do a few more frames per second um, using the GPU on the machine. So you get access to the hardware um, 
you know, through the model as well, which is which is pretty interesting when you when you've got you know more complicated models. Um, but yeah, so coming back onto the slide. Um, the reason I'm kind of showing you all of this is that we're moving into this place where we're going to have a data science life cycle alongside an engineering and developer's life cycle. And if you think about the life of a data scientist, a data scientist is about feature engineering, which is really, if you're doing traditional machine learning, it's understanding and identifying the things that are most important. And then it's going to be model training. So this is the algorithms that are required, model management, the retraining, parameter tuning, all of those things that come to creating an optimized model. And then model evaluation, so that's the um, assessing and looking at the, the outcomes of the model. So what I didn't show you is I've also got another example here uh, where I've used transfer learning on a data set of 12,000 um, photographs of benign and malign malignant uh, melanoma from a science data set. And I used uh, TensorFlow Inception uh, for doing transfer learning. And these are kind of some of the graphs that you get out of building those type of models. So you can see over time, like this was using a model net um, algorithm, and it was about maybe an hour and a half worth of um, training on the transfer learning side. And I got about 80% accuracy out of that. So if I wanted to increase the accuracy I'd have to, you know, work with the hyperparameters. I'd have to um, work on larger iterations and tune those to get a better performing model. But every time you do that, it comes back to longer training times and and, and deeper um, uh, processing. So you have to trade off how much time you want to spend um, honing the model compared to how accurate the model actually needs to be. But if you're in the space of um, you know, detecting cancer and things like that, you probably want a higher degree of accuracy than if you're trying to identify a breed of dog. Um, so I have been working with a group in Bangladesh that is using this approach for identifying tuberculosis and malaria and other um, strains from swab samples that can be taken out in the field and then can be identified using a model so that they can go straight to diagnostics as opposed to needing a long process for a physician to identify. Um, and, then, and then you kind of go into modeling, data acquisition, deployment, and then over here there's a whole you know, area of data wrangling and export and cleaning. And the reason I'm showing you this is that, um, and then this is another view of the same thing, so defining the objective, assessing the, understanding the data, pre-processing, historical data, splitting it between training sets and testing sets, testing the model, scoring the model, evaluating the model, and then in the future you have like these future data scoring the model and predicting results. Because it often happens in an iterative process. You, you build your model, you train it, you deploy it, and then you refine it and improve it, train it again, and deploy it again over time. And so Windows ML, um, you know, I talked about it before. Um, it, it does translate from a number of other uh, ML libraries, Core ML, Cafe, CNTK, Keras. And what it's really doing is, is it, it's abstracting uh, the need to understand what the capabilities of the specific machine are, GPUs, you know, direct. It just needs direct, um, I think, direct X12 or 7, uh, one of the versions, and then it starts to leverage that uh, through the runtime and through, through the API. Um, I've got a whole, bunch, a whole bunch of links here which I'm um, keen to share as well. But, um, oh, and so, sorry, what I'll show you, one more thing. Uh, I've also got a client app here, Custom Vision TensorFlow, um, and this is just a console app, and it uses a, a library called TensorFlow Sharp. Um, so if you know Miguel, he's the founder of Xamarin, um, he's been writing TensorFlow Sharp um, as a wrapper for TensorFlow um, for .NET, and that's what this uses here. So I've got that model that I just trained before to recognize, um, you know, whether a, a, a freckle is, is malignant or, or potentially uh, dangerous and worth checking out. And if you look at this one running, it goes away and it looks at the test image and it says, um, 
that's 100% sure that that one was malignant. And the reason for that is um, the test image that I was actually using was from the little brochure I got given on you know, how to look for malignant um, cancers. But if I change that one to... I changed that to a photo that I took um, of one of my moles. And then if I re-ran that, um, that's interesting. So that's giving me less conclusive results. Um, so it's saying, 56% chance not something to worry about, 44.5% um, 40, chance you need to get that checked out. Um, so this is kind of interesting. It's, it's not a science in its own right, but then this is, this is a model that tested about 80% accurate. So you can see how you could start to deploy these things uh, into like, you know, basic offline mobile apps that could serve a purpose of letting somebody know if they needed to go and you know, seek further advice or um, or look further into the solution that they could be building. Um, so just to wrap up, I thought I, I know I said I'll give you some examples of um, where we've been using some of these things. Uh, we do have, oh, sorry, there's two places. So over here, um, I'll share these links as well, but um, there's, we've published a, a, a thing called Azure AI Toolkit for IoT Edge. Um, there's a, a, a process for Azure IoT Edge anomaly detection tutorial, and this is using a new method of deploying um, Azure Machine Learning as IoT Edge module. This is again in preview, um, but there's a, a, a tutorial and step through that you can go through um, to perform that operation. Um, if I come back into the, into the core of this project, uh, there's also uh, down here, um, in NIST classification with TensorFlow, so that's the digits for like the six and the three and identifying those. Skin cancer detection, so this is a version of um, the one that I was using. I use TensorFlow Transfer Learning, this one uses Keras with uh, CMTK, not using Transfer Learning, just using that, you know, building the model from scratch. Um, but there's a whole, there's a number of examples that are out there where you can start to see how these different things work together. Uh, we've got a number of client examples as well, so uh, if you come out onto this site, um, I, I quite, we've got up at uh, Microsoft GitHub.io, um, we've got tech case studies in, in different areas, and this one here I quite like because it's again, it's a local example um, using IoT and machine learning uh, to evolve intelligent diabetes management solution. Um, here in China um, and there's some good architecture diagrams of using a IoT device to detect real-time blood glucose via Bluetooth to a mobile phone into IoT Hub, Stream Analytics um, and then over here there's some machine learning that's actually happening post-processing um, on that to, to predict particular outcomes and there's some code examples and, and artifacts that are built on that. Um, over here, there's another one for enhancing a molding process using IoT solutions uh, with uh, Faga Enderlin. And this one was essentially looking uh, inside here. This is from Spain, but it was looking for um, automated prediction for that kind, kind of came out of a five day hack fest. And again, it's using a Raspberry Pi with a Fez hat um, to look uh, inside the model and identify. Uh, when there's pre-maintenance required um, inside the solution. So if you look at that one, it's, there's a molding machine over here uh, with a bunch of sensors and IoT hub, um, and it's identifying um, when there might be defects um, using a machine learning model. So there's some code for the, you know, for the machine learning in there as well. I, I recommend you go and have a look around um, in some of these, but I'll make the slide deck available and um, put the links up there. And um, I'm just conscious of the time, but I'm happy to take any, any questions if anyone's got any questions at all about any of the stuff. Because one thing I should say is 
a lot of this is really new. Like we only announced Windows Email about 10 days ago. Um, and the code samples, you know, are running on future versions of the operating system. And so there's a, it's all in preview. So there's a whole bunch of things that are still up in the air. Um, but I, it's an exciting space. And I think if we look forward over the sort of three to five years, um, there's going to be a lot more embedding artificial intelligence and um, these type of training models inside our applications and in our devices and, you know, in the software that we build. So, um, that, yeah, any, any, any questions at all or should we wrap that up? Okay. Thank you. Okay, 那我们再一次热烈掌声，谢谢南州帕克。